apologies there for a moment um, as I dropped off there, um, but I'm back now. Um, so thank you for uh, joining us today for the Monsoon Seminar Series on our Schedule B. And today we are joined by Dr. Rajiv Saraswat from the National Institute of Oceanography in Goa. And so today, uh, Dr. Saraswat will be telling us a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, monsoon variability <clears throat> over millennial to, uh, I think, decadal timescales. And so before, again, we get started, um, just remember that if you have any questions, please type them into the chat so that we can all read them. And then at the very end, I will call on you to read out your question. And then of course, you can also raise your hand to ask your question as well if you're attending live during the Zoom. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Saraswat, would you like to share your screen? Thank you, Sada. I hope you can see the presentation now. Yeah, all good. Okay. Thanks a lot for all the efforts that Peter, Liviu, and Tara, you are taking in arranging these talks on monsoon. I've seen several of them, of course, depending upon the time frame that they are put in. Usually it's easy to attend to talks that are in the daytime than those which are uh, scheduled late in the evening. But it's really a fantastic uh, series that we are having on monsoon and people talking on monsoon from different regions and different localities. It's really good to understand the regional nature of the monsoon. I'll be talking today on the monsoon variations mainly from the Indian Ocean, the, based on the records collected from both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. And before I go on to the uh, details of the talk and the stuff that I have to present over here, I would just like to say that the work that I'll be presenting is based on my own uh, work that I did over here, along with uh, my PhD supervisor and then the several students that I had. Nigam, Murtarkar, Dinesh, Dhamen, Teja, Salim. I do see many of them in the audience here also. Thank you so much for putting up all those hard work uh, during your doctoral days in the National Institute of Oceanography. And based on that work only, I'll be summarized. I'll be putting forward things that we have done in our group. Now, monsoon, a lot has been said in this uh, uh, audience about the monsoon, how it forms depending upon the uh, thermal contrast between land and sea, along with the seasonal migration of the inter intertropical convergence zone. So I'll not go into the very basics of how the monsoon forms. I, I do believe that people are, uh, I have listened to such talks for long and then it's easy for them to figure out how the monsoon forms, but just to give you a context of what the monsoon does, especially in the Indian subcontinent. And here is the, uh, the amount of rainfall that we receive in, in the Indian subcontinent. A few things are really important in it, the regional heterogeneity. I mean, we do have regions which hardly receive any rain, for example, our neighbors Pakistan, and then further up as well. But then there are parts which receive a huge amount of rainfall during the, the summer season, especially. Uh, two particular reasons are important for very heavy rainfall. For example, this Western Ghats region and the Northeastern states of uh, our country, India. In fact, to put things in a bit of perspective, uh, the monsoon is responsible for almost a lot of things on this in this country, in the Indian subcontinent. We get plenty of our drinking water because of the rainfall. And the amount of rain that we get, it's almost like more than 120 centimeters, all India average, 
imagine a meter and a quarter of water all over India on an average. And especially some states like the state where I'm uh, sitting and talking today, Goa, we receive almost three and a half meters of rain during the summer season. It's a huge amount of water that we receive. Usually monsoon is something that uh, almost everybody looks forward because it comes after the scorching heat, the summer monsoon heat. People really look forward, barring those extreme events of, say, uh, flooding. It's, it's a fantastic season in India. And why is it so important? I'm sure people might have talked about this also. We do have a lot of advancements in different spheres of technology and science, but still we depend a lot on the monsoon precipitation. It's just a simple correlation between the deviation of the all India summer monsoon rainfall from an average, which is like 30 to 40 years average. And with respect to the, uh, the food grain production, its impact on the food grain production. So despite the advancements that we have done, there still seems to be a close link between the deviations in the monsoon associated rainfall and the food grain production. And since agriculture seems to be one of the backbone of the several countries in the Indian subcontinent, it ultimately affects the GDP of those countries. There is no doing away with the monsoon. We really need to understand how this monsoon varies. We can figure out if we can project accurately how things are going to be in the future. That's what the governments and people look forward. And that's where people like me are still in the job, trying to figure out what are the factors which affect monsoon. So looking at what are what does this monsoon cause? Because that's We do see extremely severe winds during the monsoon season. And the winds cause a lot of upwelling or convective mixing in the oceans, nearby oceans, for example, both the Arabian Sea, especially the western margin of the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal as well, part of that. And this upwelling convective mixing ultimately brings in nutrient-rich cold water to the surface thus increasing the productivity because nutrients are now available at the surface, sunlight is available, the productivity increases, tremendous amount of organic matter forms and ultimately that leads to the carbon barrier. So that's one aspect of the monsoon, winds and associated processes. The other aspect of the monsoon is the direct precipitation. We receive huge amount of rainfall as I was showing you in a a couple of slides earlier that we receive almost 120 centimeters of rain every year, for example, in Indian uh, in India. So that precipitation ultimately leads to a lot of runoff or recharge. Recharge is what we try to drink during the rest of the year, including the uh, I mean non-monsoon months, and also runoff runoff through the rivers into the nearby basins. And a lot of weathering and erosion happens because of that uh, precipitation. Heavy rainfall leads to the erosion of the topsoil, and then ultimately a significant amount of it goes down into the nearby basins as freshwater or to these inputs. Now, these are the two basic processes which are governed by monsoon, and people have made use of these two processes to understand the monsoon variation on both short time scale as well as in the past. Now, looking at the, the winds and its effect in the ocean, we know it causes, uh, there is a lot of difference or uh, change in the wind pattern on different time scales from the um, months of the summer season, say July, June, July, August, September, wherein we get a strong wind lighter jet moving into the India and other nearby regions and bringing a huge amount of rainfall as compared to rest of the time, especially during the winter seasons that we receive hardly any rainfall. What it causes in the Indian Ocean, especially Northern Indian Ocean is, uh, say, it's cumulative chlorophyll, integrated chlorophyll, 
in during different seasons and we get huge amount of these productivity in the western arabian sea parts of the eastern arabian sea also especially the southern region southeastern arabian sea we do get partly some of whaling cells in the the western bay of bengal but that's very narrow zone to which this of whaling is confined the during the winter season we do get uh, the productivity high in the northern arabian sea especially northeastern arabian sea which is basically because of the convective mixing now the timing of the summer bloom also varies as in certain parts it's during say uh, april may but in rest of the parts it just delays further during the august september and during the winter months it's usually during the november december or sometimes in the january so looking at these cumulative changes in the chlorophyll content and the summer bloom people have tried to uh, categorize different parts of the indian ocean into the zones which are affected by either the upwelling or induced uh, you know productivity changes during the summer season or during the winter season the reason i put forward this figure is that uh, summer monsoon or winter monsoon they have a huge heterogeneity regionality they don't cause a uniform change all over and there are zones or there are localities or regions which receive huge amount of productivity and then the upwelling because of that a lot of processes happen but then at the same time there are other parts where we don't see a significant change in the productivity or associated parameter same is the case with the winter season what is the implication it implies that if we are trying to look at the monsoon records or trying to reconstruct monsoon records we have to really figure out what is affecting which area and how the proxies are behaving in that area of course there might be some Uh, similarity in the behavior of the proxy carriers but then again each record will show us the signatures of that particular region and that's where the regional nature of the monsoon comes into picture or any other related phenomena and that has to be looked at that brings us to the point where we really need to first figure out the proxies working for a particular location and in our group we have been working on that aspect for long right from the beginning of my doctoral studies that we try I'm trying to figure out is there anything specific that we can get for the specific regions of the indian ocean especially because now the emphasis is now on the marginal marine regions of india simply because we get huge amount of sediment being discharged into that area and that leads to a very high sedimentation rate and that's what is required these days so we have been working in on the margins of india for quite long time during different cruises we try to collect samples and then look at what is working where which proxy we can use and what that particular proxy tells us so these are some of the samples that we have collected during different cruises and then we looked at both the microfossils like benthic and planktic foraminifers in these sediments and i'll be showing you some of the results of these uh, work papers or analysis that we did on these samples recently again we collected some samples from this part wherein we didn't had samples earlier and that's an important area because we don't get any signatures of summer monsoon in this area and but this area is hugely impacted during the winter monsoon season and that's why we again went back and then collected samples from that area now looking at the the abundance of planktic foraminifers these are one of the frequently used microfossils for paleoclimatic studies a lot of proxies based on planktic foraminifera are used either the single species the species assemblies their isotopic composition both oxygen and carbon and now even nitrogen for denitrification aspects and the elemental ratios for sea surface temperature for example magnesium by calcium and barium by calcium for runoff they are they are one of uh, i mean they are very frequently used so we wanted to look at how are they behaving in this particular eastern margin of india 
we realize that we get the highest abundance of these planktic foraminifers in the in the northern part and as well as in the, the southern part. And the number varies tremendously, almost being absent in the marginal regions to very high uh, abundance in, in the relatively deeper parts. Similarly, we do see a very high population of planktic foraminifers in the in the southern part of the eastern margin of India. Of there is a particular state called Tamil Nadu. Of that, we do see also that will be in the uh, southwestern Bay of Bengal. The planktic foraminiferal abundance is higher than anywhere else along the entire eastern margin of India or entire western Bay of Bengal. That's about the total planktic, but then we also started looking at the relative abundance of the species. We know some of them are the backbone of the paleo monsoon studies, for example, Lobigerina boroides and uh, some other species. So we realized that, yes, this species is also abundant along the margin of India, but its abundance is confined to relatively narrow zone towards the outer shelf or upper slope region and towards the central part of the Western Bay of Bengal. And later on, when we looked at the physical oceanography papers, and it was apparent that we get strong upwelling, not very strong like the way we get it in the Western Arabian Sea, but just upwelling in this part during the summer season. And that's where we get good uh, abundance of the Globigerina boloides, suggesting that, yes, that seems to work in the, along the Western margin of India. There are other species also, and for example, rover, which doesn't like low salinity because of the riverine influx from Ganga and Brahmaputra. That's why its abundance is quite high towards the, the southern part of the Western Arabian Sea. So there are species which do show something similar uh, abundance as seen from other parts of the world ocean. But I'll come to that point later that there are species which do behave slightly differently or some of them completely different when it comes to another aspect of these species. So we looked at what are the major parameters affecting these species, uh, uh, combining both the salinity and temperature at the surface mixed layer, as well as the thermocline temperature and salinity. And we uh, do uh, find out that the boloides, of course, it uh, shows an opposite relationship with the temperature because it prefers the relatively cooler temperature and uh, is positively correlated with the organic carbon. Of course, it's a species which lives in the air, waters which have high amount of organic matter or food availability. So some of these species show very distinct uh, behavior as far as the, the ambient seawater parameters are concerned. I just want to make it clear that these parameters are annual average because we have collected these samples from the sediment, so we try to look at the annual average. Of course, the results may be slightly different if we look at the seasonal changes in any of these parameters that can also be looked at. Similarly, we did see that the boloides, which was abundant in the northern part, is slightly, again, confined to the northern part of the, the Western Arabian Sea, but almost uh, in very low numbers where we hardly get any uh, uh, productivity or uh, any runoff during the summer monsoon season. Uh, interestingly, in this area, we find a huge number of glutinata and their abundance goes to almost 35 to 40 percent in the southern part of the, the Western Arabian Sea. And uh, this area we receive sufficient, uh, I mean, large amount of uh, precipitation as well as the runoff from the rivers during the winter time. So this species seems to be preferring the ambient conditions which prevail during the winter season in the in the Western Arabians. Again, uh, we looked at the, just combined these species from the southern part of the, the Western Bay of Bengal and then we realized that yes, these species are showing distinct behavior with the ambient parameters in this area. And as usual, we did not find boloides to be showing any good correlation in, in this area because this area is not much influenced by the, the summer monsoon season and up, uh, the upwelling intensity. Uh, 
since we get huge amount of sediments on the shelf and sedimentation rate is very high in certain parts so but the planktic foraminifers are not abundant uh, in those sediments simply because the ecology of planktic foraminifers allows them to be more comfortable in slightly deeper waters where they can even migrate and then they don't get too much of turbid waters so we started looking at whether we can have some of those benthic foraminiferal proxies for the monsoon in this part and we looked at right in front of the ganga and uh, brahmaputra river mouth and looked at several benthic foraminiferal parameters what we realized was that a particular type of these benthic foraminifers they are serially uh, uh, having uh, arranged chambers serial forms they are known as angular asymmetrical benthic foraminifers they are very abundant uh, away from the river mouth whereas their counterpart the rounded symmetrical benthic foraminifers they are hugely abundant in front of right in front of the river mouth now that's a technique long back proposed by uh, the workers including dr negam he suggested based on the arabian sea surface sediment samples that this proxy can be used as an indicator of the monsoon runoff in near shore regions wherein in front of the river mouth and what they suggested was that since we get huge turbulence high energy environment in that it's uh, obvious that the the comfortable morphology is something which is round in shape is spherical in shape that's why those rounded symmetrical benthic foraminifers are abundant in the shallow water regions in front of the river mouth whereas the angular asymmetrical forms they are less abundant and they increase in number if you move away from the river mouth and that uh, proxy seems to be the uh, working in front in the northern bay of bengal also and right in front of the river mouth we'll make use of that in uh, subsequently also another interesting uh, work that uh, dr negam and one of his phd student rajni has done is that they looked at one particular species again just like bolides we have for summer monsoon intensity they suggested that you can use astrorotelia trispinosa although its name is now sometimes referred to as astrorotelia pulchella and its relative abundance indicates It, it prefers very low salinity environment. So, if you find a core from shallow water region, and if you have this species in the sediments, you can use its relative abundance to reconstruct monsoon. They had worked on sediments in front of the Irrawaddy River. We thought, let's look at since we had those samples all along the the western mar western uh, Bay of Bengal or eastern margin of India. We tried to look at how its abundance varies. Does it also prefer the low salinity environment here? and yes this species was most abundant wherein we had the least salinity and warmer temperature in the in the northern part of the the bay of bengal especially in front of ganga and brahmaputra rivers as well as other rivers wherein salinity was low which shows that yes this species definitely prefers very low salinity and high amount of organic matter as well as warmer temperature something which happens in the in the shallow inner shelf regions and then yes this species is a good indicator of the past monsoon and runoff from the rivers is this all material getting preserved in the sediments no that doesn't happen we know that the planktic foraminiferal dust which settled down from the surface hardly 5 to 10% of it only finally settles in the sediment then the question arises how much of the original information is preserved are we really getting the, those original signatures preserved in the sediments we try to look at that aspect as well that where do we find a significant resolution is this the these calcareous organisms or calcareous test or shells of foraminifers are they getting very well preserved in the sediments or are they getting dissolved and if they are getting uh, significantly dissolved at what depth and whether it is also affecting the the species assemblies or their isotopic composition so we looked at all of these sediments planktic foraminiferal abundance in the top 1 cm of those uh, multi core and spade core samples and we realized that at certain depth and that seemed to be quite shallow just at 1000 m we do see a significant drop in the abundance of planktic foraminifers 
if you see the numbers at around maybe 2000 or more per uh, gram of sediment up to 1000 meter then below that it's confined to hardly 250 or 100 uh, shells in per one gram of sediment so why is it that we are getting such a significant low abundance at 1000 meter and does it because of the dissolution we try to look at those aspects of course we looked at traditionally um, dissolution susceptible and dissolution resistant species many people have worked on plankton for many first on different parts of the world ocean and they have suggested that there are certain set of species which resist dissolution because of the study test whereas others more fragile plankton foraminiferal species they are unable to sustain because of the the fragile nature of the test and their shells dissolve that leads to a change in the relative abundance of the dissolution susceptible and dissolution resistant species now we looked at a uh, six prominent dissolution resistant species in the western bay of bengal and not all of them show an increase with that we were surprised to know that some of these species like falconensis in fact their abundance decreased with that not increasing with that same was the case with another species calida although they were suggested as dissolution resistant species but no in the western bay of bengal they seem to be behaving completely differently but yes minardi and few other species for example the obliquely oclata its abundance increases with that and they can be used as a dissolution resistant species and can be used as an indicator of the extent of dissolution in, in this part of the, the, the northern indian ocean similarly we found uh, different signatures in the the dissolution susceptible species also for example rover in fact we couldn't make out any difference in its abundance right from very shallow regions to the deeper region almost a similar variation rubescence of course it decreased in abundance because simply because it's a fragile species not the case with the ruber tanellus of course followed a similar pattern siphonifera also followed but again not cyclifer we didn't see any huge difference in its abundance as going down broadis of course again showed a very prominent uh, decrease in the abundance when you go below a certain depth especially around 1500 meters or 1000 meters so we again thought whether the previously proposed techniques of looking at the dissolution because people try to figure out first whether the assemblage is preserved or not before going on to using those planktic assemblages for plank, uh, reconstructing monsoon whether this area works well or not for planktic foraminiferal assemblages so we try to evaluate some of those techniques suggested to uh, interpret or to infer the the dissolution extent and yes when we look at the dissolution resistant assemblages yes they do give us uh, some idea but not very conclusive evidence because there are certain data points at shallow water depth also which have relatively higher abundance of those dissolution resistant species but what works the best is the fragmentation index suggested by lee and shackleton here we do see a apparent and very prominent change in the the uh, dissolution indice below the thousand meter wherein we were seeing a large decrease in the plankton foraminiferal abundance and also the ratio between dissolution resistant to dissolution susceptible assemblies that also seems to work well if we are trying to figure out the change in the plankton foraminiferal assemblies because of dissolution so so uh, a person can use these techniques to figure out whether the original plankton foraminiferal assemblage is preserved up to what extent now these are all uh, sort of a qualitative proxies which give us an idea about whether the monsoon was higher or lower but then people these days prefer more of the numbers and quantitative estimates of the monsoon and one of the frequently used parameters for reconstructing monsoon is the stable oxygen isotopic ratio of the foraminifers now the way the oxygen isotopic ratio of the foraminifers is controlled by several parameters it 
mainly depends on the ambient sea water oxygen isotopic ratio the ambient temperature at which the foraminiferal shells are secreted or they are formed the carbonate ion concentration of the water and the vital effects this is a species related effects depending upon <coughs> excuse me how fast the species varies and how uh, uh, quickly they build up their test in the initial stage or at the later stage of course temperature there are other ways now to reconstruct the the sea water temperature by using elemental analysis or even alkenons or tax there are several techniques if those uh, we can reconstruct the temperature we are left with something with the delo 18 of sea water and that's what is made use of to reconstruct the salinity now salinity uh, why we use this parameter because the oxygen isotopic ratio of the sea water depends on the direct precipitation in an area the evaporation from that area and the runoff in that area because the partial pressure difference in different lighter and heavier isotopes of oxygen leads to removal of the lighter isotopes preferentially in the vapor phase as compared to the heavier isotopes that are left behind in the in the liquid phase subsequently when this vapor gets deposited in the ice sheets or as the runoff on land it has relatively lighter isotopes and then that when it comes as a runoff either from the direct rains or melting of the ice sheets it contributes significant amount of the relatively lighter isotopes as compared to the heavier isotopes so that's what is usually made of to reconstruct the the precipitation evaporation budget or runoff changes in an area the species which is frequently used for this purpose is the surface dweller globigerinoides rubber it's and there are different varieties of that but depending upon the area where in a person is working like for example in the northern indian ocean we get only this variety in the uh, sediments uh, younger than 125 to 130 kilo years beyond that in older sediments of course we get the pink variety also so we try to look at of course there are uh, some studies on uh, trying to figure out whether the oxygen isotopic composition of this species exactly takes care of the the isotopic composition or the runoff precipitation changes in the in indian ocean but we try to figure out whether the, the studies were basically from the open ocean and some from uh, these parts as you can see we thought that whether let's look at those riverine influx region in front of iravadi as well as those rivers which are draining from the indian subcontinent whether the isotopic signatures are still intact and what it is ultimately recording so we collected all those blue samples these are new samples which were collected by us either the multi core spade core samples core top samples and then we also uh, compiled all the previous studies that people have published from either the single core tops or a set of surface sediment samples collected by different people over the years and we put all of that data together this is a background is the sea water temperature of course this part is the uh, indo pacific warm pool and we do see a variation from around uh, of course this area remains warmer than 2080 degree centigrade but we also have some cooler regions towards the western arabian sea so the samples cover almost the uh, different water temperature that we can think of although a bit of more concentration in the indo pacific warm pool means that the samples are from the locations which have the sea water temperature warmer than 20 degrees centigrade similarly the samples cover the diverse salinity regimes that we have in the northern indian ocean the low salinity regions in the the bay of bengal especially the northern bay of bengal and the high salinity regions of the western arabian sea so the samples have an good coverage and that's also reflected in the oxygen isotopic composition that's uncorrected stable oxygen isotopic composition of globigerinoides rubber collected in surface sediment samples and we were really happy to see that the the in, even in the sediments rubber isotopic composition reflects or it is still uh, seems to be modulated by the salinity variations that we see over here the low salinity regions in the northern bay of bengal is 
seen with a very lighter isotopic uh, values uh, in the oxynisotropic composition of the obesity in work. We wanted to further look at what are the other parameters which are affecting this oxynisotropic composition. So we uh, tried to look at whether there is any, uh, say, locational variation. But when we were again surprised to see that there is a, seems to be a strong latitudinal signature, and that's obvious, expected as well, because of the change in salinity from the the low salinity region of the the eastern Bay of Bengal to the high salinity region of the western Bay of Bengal. That's where the longitude comes into picture, and that seems to having a strong, uh, I mean, good correlation with the the uncorrected globigerinoides rubber oxynisotropic ratio. Again, the temperature, or see the lat latitude, the north-south movement doesn't seem to have any apparent relationship or strong uh, impact on the globigerinoides rubber oxynisotropic ratio. Another important aspect that we saw by plotting all of this, uh, this data with the depth was that there is a strong depth dependent variation in the oxynisotropic ratio of the rubber. With increasing depth, the isotopic ratio seems to be heavier as compared to the shallow water regions, wherein the isotopic composition seems to be comparatively lighter. And the reason for this is probably that the, the parts which have these lighter isotopic signal, they are more prone to dissolution as compared to the, the parts of the shells, which, shell which is having higher uh, or the heavier isotopic composition. And that leads to a strong change, uh, a large change in the oxygen isotopic composition of rubber with increasing water depth, so much so that uh, that every one kilometer increase in the water depth leads to almost 0.2 per mil change in the oxygen isotopic composition of rubber. That does not matter if a person is working at the same place in the same core and using the same species. But if we want to compare the cores collected from different regions, different water depths, we need to account for the depth related dissolution or change in the oxygen isotopic composition. Done with the depth, we again uh, try to figure out whether the real parameters which are related to monsoon, for example, both the salinity and temperature, do they affect the stable oxygen isotopic composition of rubber? And yes, we were glad to see that the rubber is. Uh, very well taking up the signatures of the ambient seawater salinity. The correlation was really good, 0.73 R square, and we did see a strong relationship between oxygen isotopic ratio of rubber and the ambient salinity. Please remember that it's again uh, uncorrected the low 18 rubber. Unfortunately, with the temperature, we did not see such a strong relationship, and that because of the fact that majority of these samples are within a very narrow temperature range. As the equatorial uh, region of the Indian Ocean is a part of the Indo-Pacific warm pool, this area is influenced by the, has very limited temperature range, and that's why we don't see much influence of this temperature variability on the uncorrected day uh, the, uh, rumor. We also uh, tried to look at whether the the salinity has a different signatures in the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. Yes, there is a minor variation in the uncorrected yellow 18 rubber with the salinity in the Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, slight difference, but the correlation is still significant at a significant P value. We calculated the expected yellow 18 calcite by using the surface water delta O18, which has been done by a lot of people. There were almost 7,800 data points on surface seawater oxygen isotopic ratio, and then we correlated that with the ambient salinity, developed the relationship, and then thought, uh, estimated what should be the expected calcite value at the locations from which we have got the uh, globigerinoides rubber surface sediment data, and both seems to be very well correlated with a correlation value of 0.63, which again uh, confirms the fact that the Globigerinoides rubber is very well taking up the signatures of the seawater uh, conditions, ambient seawater conditions. With temperature, of course, the relationship was not that significant, but still uh, with n value of 329 data points, that still seems to be significant. 
Now, using all these uh, proxies to understand the paleo monsoon, I'll be now talking about the paleo monsoon reconstruction, starting from short term scales to the millennial scales that we have done from this part of the Indian Ocean. We had a core collected from the Penar River that was just off the one of the strong major rivers of the, the peninsular India, Penar. And this core, we got a very high sedimentation rate, almost 75 centimeter per kilo year, giving us almost 10 to 12 years uh, data for every centimeter. And that's where we looked at the technique that I have shown you earlier, the relative abundance of angular asymmetrical and rounded symmetrical for amifers. And we do see some systematic variations during the last around 2000 years, so-called common era, that 2000 years we do see that variability. We try to figure out if there is any periodicity because the short-term uh, monsoon data, instrumental monsoon data suggests 60 year cyclicity. So whether we do see uh, some extended form of that cyclicity in the, the record that we have, and yes, the we did see a strong 123 year or 120 year cyclicity in the, the angular asymmetrical benthic for Amifa, suggesting that, that the monsoon is strongly correlated with the, with the, the sunspot or solar insulation changes. Same code, we extended our work and uh, went back to the entire Holocene then, and then looked at how things are during the entire Holocene. Uh, during certain part of this work, we didn't get enough benthic, so couldn't extend that benthic for amiferal work. So we switched over to another important proxy, the Globi Jarina Boloides, relative abundance. And we do see a significant change during three different subdivisions of the Holocene, which are recently made, the Greenland, the North European, and uh, the Megalian. The relative abundance of Boloides was high during the Greenlandian, suggesting that the upwelling was strong, but the oxygen-isotopic ratio of the rubber, uh, of course, it was still decreasing, suggesting that the monsoon was uh, weaker. Uh, that doesn't seem to go well with the, the upwelling indices. I'll discuss that a little later. During the North Caribbean, the abundance decreased significantly. So did we see a, a sort of a stagnant phase in the uh, oxygen-isotopic ratio of the rubber. A decreasing phase during the Megalian and but and uh, sort of a relatively intense monsoon as compared to North European uh, as based on the global number ideas. So we looked at other multi proxy parameters here, the organic carbon to nitrogen ratio, the total organic carbon as well as the 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 calcium carbonate percentage, and then we corrected the oxygen isotopic ratio of the rubber for the sea level variations as well as the temperature. So it's a temperature and ice volume corrected derivative in seawater, suggesting the regional precipitation, evaporation, and runoff changes. What we see uh, very peculiar here is that uh, we don't, of course, in beginning that seems to match with the upwelling intensity indicator voloides, but during the subsequent part, it does show some short scale variability, but overall it's not changing much, whereas the upwelling indicator voloides has decreased significantly. And so does we see a change, we do not see much change in the organic carbon percentage also. So what it implies? It implies that although the upwelling decreased, but it does not lead to a significant change in the evaporation precipitation budget in, in the, the central part of the Western Bay of Bengal. And it also does not lead to any significant change in the minor change, only minor change in the organic carbon percentage. Similarly, the organic carbon percentage increased significantly, leading to increased carbon burial. But the monsoon was, uh, the upwelling was relatively weaker. So in the this part of the Bay of Bengal, the upwelling is not, doesn't seem to be closely linked with the organic carbon. So organic carbon doesn't seem to be working well for the uh, as a proxy for the upwelling because of course there are lots of parameter of factors which affect the organic carbon preservation in the sediments depending upon the plane size the dissolved oxygen concentration in the sediment lots of other parameters we again looked at this longer term uh, variations whether there is any short term periodicity yes and we were 
I mean, surprised to see again a 210 year cyclicity at uh, significant at 90% confidence interval, and that matches with the Swiss cycle in the radiocarbon variations that people have reported earlier, suggesting that yes, there, there are strong uh, there is a strong influence of the solar insulation and radiocarbon variability on the the monsoon variations or upwelling intensity as well as the 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 evaporation precipitation budget wherein we saw a significant 400 year periodicity instead of the 210 year periodicity in the colloidus of Andes. At a counterpart in the, the Arabian Sea, we looked at the, uh, again, a similar Holocene record. And what we realized was that we do see some, uh, something similar, but we do not see a drop in the Delo 18 Ruber at in the, the North Gripian phase that we were seeing in the Bay of Bengal. But what was interesting over here was that the climate or other parameters in the sediments as well as in other regional proxies, they all show a significant shift during the mid-Holocene. And that's what we termed as the mid-Holocene climate transition. And interestingly, the Indus civilization that proliferated at the same time, wherein the monsoon seemed to have uh, stabilized. The temperature also seemed to be going towards a slightly lower phase, or uh, it was just sort of stable for some time. And uh, exactly at that time, we do see the huge change in the Indus civilization that again suggests that, yes, the monsoon is not only important during the modern times, but it has been a driving factor for the civilizations right from the very beginning of those civilizations. We looked at a longer term record from the same uh, uh, core again, and a very interesting record of the sea surface temperature we reconstructed by using the elemental ratio, magnesium by calcium ratio. <coughs> Sorry. The record seemed to be having a different variability than so-called northern and southern hemisphere arctic and antarctic temperature records but matching with the the average uh, hemispheric records uh, apparently we did see uh, the warming significantly prior to the the change in uh, the carbon dioxide concentration of course this chronology has been revised now and as of now we don't see i mean both seems to be almost simultaneous but yes, the temperature seems to be correlated well with the, with the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentration. We looked at the temperature because we wanted to understand how much this temperature is affecting the monsoon. So we, uh, with the monsoon variability, what we looked at at the elemental ratio again at the barium by calcium, that gives us an idea about the riverine runoff in this area, and also the temperature and salinity corrected day low 18. What was interesting was that the deglaciation, starting from uh, say around uh, 18 kilo years and going on until the beginning of the Holocene at around 12 kilo years, it was supposed to be a weak monsoon phase with a almost two weak monsoon intervals were uh, prominent in the in the uh, the monsoon records and interrupted by a phase wherein the monsoon was intense and that's what we saw in the runoff as well as the local uh, regional precipitation evaporation budget. This was the uh, concept given based on the speleothem records from uh, China that probably the deglaciation was uh, marked by weak monsoon intervals, a couple of weak monsoon intervals. And then our record from the southeastern Arabian Sea confirmed that, yes, uh, that's not a, a, a precipitation effect or any uh, any change in the source of the water moisture that is going to the Spiliotham secretion region, but that seems to be a, a regional or on global scale that the weak monsoon interval punctuated the deglaciation. Uh, the monsoon in the uh, modern monsoon, uh, these physical model uh, oceanographers and modelers, they clearly suggest that the, the shift from the summer monsoon to winter monsoon is modulated by the insulation gradient between the equator and the northern latitudes. Now, 
if that's the case at present, why not that happen in the, the past or does that happen in the past? That's what we try to look at when we uh, again looked at our core from the equatorial Indian Ocean. We reconstructed the salinity again by using the, the water oxygen-isotopic ratio and the salinity relationship. And we plotted that with the temperature, which was again as expected warmer during the last interglacial or the Eemian time, uh, isotopic stage 5e. But what was interesting was that when we plotted the salinity variations with the difference in the insulation uh, gradient between the equator and the northern latitudes, and during the glacial times, we did see a strong uh, covariance between the salinity and the latitudinal insulation gradient, suggesting very clearly that yes, these two parameters are linked. The difference in the insulation between the equator and the northern latitudes drives the the precipitation or runoff in the, the northern Indian Ocean, as it suggested a good correlation between the salinity changes and the insulation anomaly. Uh, the the in, equatorial Indian Ocean is part of the Indo-Pacific warm pool, and that's the region which drives a lot of phenomena in the in the world, including walker circulation, El Nino, uh, La Nina, lots of parameters. We were curious to understand how does this uh, structure of the Indo-Pacific warm pool varies on different glacial interglacial time scales and how the monsoon modulates that. Whether does it has any vari any influence on the monsoon variability? And that's where we uh, worked on a core from the western part of the 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 Indo-Pacific warm pool. That's the core SK237 GC09 gravity core. And then we compiled all this data from the different parts of the equatorial oceans in the Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific Ocean. The elemental ratio, which is an indicator of the seawater temperature, shows a large variability in different parts of these equatorial coasts with almost negligible changes compared to the western part of the indo pacific warm pool in the ODP core 871, which was collected from the central Pacific region. A uh, similar variation was also seen in the oxygen isotopic ratio in these different cores. So we thought of calculating the anomalies in the seawater temperature as well as in the, uh, the seawater uh, salinity. So when we plotted all the temperature curves together, there were few things which were apparent. That during the interglacial marine isotopic stage 5b, the spread in the seawater temperature was much reduced as compared to the glacial interval. Throughout the glacial interval, there was a large spread in the seawater temperature, suggesting a huge variability in the Indo-Pacific warm pool structure during the glacial and inter, sorry, during the interglacial and glacial times. And that also has a strong bearing on the, the uh, I mean, that is seemed to be modulated by the monsoon precipitation because during the same interglacial stage, we don't see much variation in the the, uh, the temperature corrected del 18 sea water, but a large variation in the temperature corrected del 18 sea water during the glacial times. And that's basically because we do see a strong monsoon influence uh, in the western part of this Indo Pacific warm pool, that is the, uh, the equatorial Indian Ocean, during the interglacial times when monsoon is very strong as compared to the glacial times. So, monsoon has a strong influence or strong bearing and controlling the, the, the latitudinal structure of the Indo-Pacific warm pool or the evaporation precipitation budget of the Indo-Pacific warm pool region. Now, we had, uh, I had a particular opportunity to go into this IODP expedition 355 and we were thinking of collecting uh, sediments rich in carbonate all throughout going to the Miocene, Oligocene time, but unfortunately only uh, the sediments of last one million years contain significant amount of uh, carbonate and I worked on part of that and then we found that uh, there are species which show a strong variation, of course the resolution was also not very high. So this wood was collected from a zone which is now these days influenced not too much by the upwelling during the summer monsoon, but to some extent by the winter convective mixing during the, the winter season. So, but 
to our surprise when we looked at the summer monsoon assemblages and winter monsoon assemblages in this score that matched well with the stack being reported from the western arabian sea which is a typical upwelling zone so the variability although of course this score is from the northeastern arabian sea the record matches with the the uh, assembly or the record developed from the typical upwelling zone so the probably the advection of those uh, nutrient rich water still leads to the proliferation of these species as it happens during uh, in the upwelling zone uh, that's what we could infer recently one of my students sudeep bhadra uh, most likely he'll give a detailed talk on these records he worked on a uh, uh, drill hole samples from iudp expedition 353 and we looked at that entire drill hole section of around 1.45 million years and we do see a strong variation in the uh, the species for example we look at the the rubber sacrifer bolloides which shows a large variation during different times so clubbing the similar species like the one we have done in case of the iudp expedition 3534 here also we club them into summer and winter monsoon assemblages and then plotted what we get uh, the summer monsoon assemblage is definitely showing uh, increased abundance during relatively warmer interstadials as compared to the colder stadials and the opposite is the case with the winter monsoon assemblage which suggests increased abundance during the relatively colder uh, sub sub uh, the inter uh, stadial phases so we try to look at whether the this uh, since the time frame also covered the mid pleistocene transition so whether we do see any apparent change in the summer and winter monsoon periodicity and yes the the mid pleistocene transition strongly modulated the pace at which or the periodicity at which the summer and winter monsoon assemblages vary we further looked at the the mixed layer and thermocline variability by looking at the assemblages as well as the difference in the oxygen isotopic ratio of the species dwelling in the mixed layer for example rubber which was was data was generated by clements and published in 2021 and then we compare that with the dutatory data which is a typical thermocline dweller i'm uh, not going to much details of that curve but the uh, the one prominent change that prior to mid pleistocene transition the difference in the oxygen isotopic ratio of the surface dwelling rubber and the thermocline dweller uh, dutatory was showing a large variability on glacial interglacial time scale which reduced significantly post the mid pleistocene transition that means monsoon not only affects the the surface features but also strongly modulates the water column stratification changes now what is all this uh, uh, monsoon signatures leading to does it uh, ultimately lead to changes in the accumulation in the sediments we compile the data along uh, on all the radiocarbon dated coasts along the western margin of india on the eastern arabian sea and what we realized was that the zone of high sedimentation at times it shifts these are the last glacial maximum glacial interglacial transition the data was averaged for four time slices the last glacial maximum glacial interglacial transition early holocene and late holocene so the zone of high sedimentation rate sometimes shifts we don't see high sedimentation rate in this part uh, along the southeastern arabian sea during the lgm or even the glacial interglacial transition but we see strong uh, increase in the sedimentation rate during the holocene times but what was more surprising what that we do of course there was a large variability in the sedimentation rate and majority of the coast had below 20 cm per kilo year but during the cumulative sediment accumulation during lgm glacial interglacial transition early holocene and late holocene it does not change significantly of course there was a variation from around 10 and a half cm per kilo year to around 12 cm per kilo year but that was not very significant as expected in a monsoon dominated region and then with the strong variability during the glacial time and interglacial time and that's probably because lot of other processes govern the accumulation of carbonate at the bottom now going into the global implications of the monsoon just a couple of slides in this presentation the 
uh, we people have rep reported a strong low in the Delta C13. And we also got the similar signatures in Delta C13 low during the deglaciation. But what was interesting was that this low in the Delta C13, which was related to a lot of other factors, global factors earlier, was matching very well with a significant drop in the productivity in the Eastern Arabian Sea. And we saw that drop reflecting in the weakening of the monsoon as well. So that means the drop in Delta C13 was uh, also modulated by the drop in productivity because productivity leads to a strong change in the carbon isotopic signatures because the lighter isotopes are taken up by the organic matter preferentially. But does this uh, monsoon variation on glacial interglacial time scale affect the carbon barrier? We compiled the records from the Eastern Arabian Sea again. Of course, there seems to be some variability on glacial interglacial time scale, but then there are certain cores which show no uh, variation, I mean, completely different variation on as compared to other cores. And that's apparent also, and that's what I was telling you in the beginning that these different locations are expected to uh, preserve different signatures. And same was seen in the organic carbon accumulation also, which doesn't match at all, because the organic carbon is again dependent on the grain size as well as the dissolved oxygen concentration. Recently, again, what we have su suggested that the deglacial variations in the in the equatorial Indian Ocean uh, or the southeastern Arabian Sea they are somehow related to the to the deglaciation that happened and by uh, modulating the parameters in the high northern latitudes in the Arctic region. That was the PhD work by my student Dr. Dhamen Pratap Singh. He is right now in IIT Roorkee and he has joined us uh, for the talk today. So I, I think I've taken almost an hour. So just to summarize quickly that uh, all this, what I have already informed that we do see a large uh, variability in different parameters and not much in the sedimentation rate as uh, trispon as far as a variable, uh, as an indicator of the monsoon, glutinata probably indicating winter monsoon season, colloid is abundant during the summer monsoon season, MIS 5V increased effort for Shivata runoff, modulating the Indo Pacific warm pool structure. The oxygen isotopic ratio changing significantly depending upon a lot of parameters. And similar variations like uh, strong modulation of the monsoon by the uh, insulation changes. Over the years that I've been working in this field, I've got funding from different agencies. My uh, Institute Council of Scientific and Industrial Research that has provided bulk of the funding, Department of Science and Technology. Ministry of Earth Sciences, National Center of Polar and Ocean Research, Indo US Science and Technology Forum, DAD, IODP. That's where I land over here. Thank you so much for your patient listening. I'm sorry I've taken a little more time. I should have finished up five minutes earlier so that we can take more questions. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful talk. Um, it, I think that if you aren't convinced about the power of forums, um, you should be convinced now um, <laughs> after Dr. Saraswat's talk. Um, the, the time scales in which you can explore and the types of parameters you can explore, it's quite, are quite useful. Um, so we'll allow everybody a minute here to type into your questions into the chat or um, you're also welcome to uh, raise your hand um, as well. Um, and I can just call on you. Oh, we have our first question. Um, uh, Dulce, would you like to read your question out loud? Hello, good morning. Uh, good really morning. excellent talk, thank you so much. So I was wondering if the insulation period <coughs> was also behind the shift that you talk about during the mid Holocene that was relating to the changes in the Indian civilization. Thank you very much for giving us some clues so that we can work on data further. Yes, I mean, that's what we will we'll definitely try to look at that because now we have that long-term record. And the way we saw that at least during the glacial times, the insulation gradient between the equator and the northern latitudes influences the monsoon. Maybe uh, that also affects the uh, the change that or the shift that we saw in the Indian monsoon 
because of the mid Pleistocene transition. We will definitely try to look at that. We have not looked at it yet. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. The um, mid Pleistocene transition data that you have is uh, quite fascinating. So I look forward to reading um, your paper um, about that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience here? Surely not, come on. Yeah. Ah, we have a, a question um, from uh, Dr. Rajiv Nigam. Um, would you like to read out your question? See, with the enhanced uh, understanding of decadal records, is it possible to give some idea about future rainfalls? I mean, again, a very, I would say, interesting as well as pertinent question. That's what the modelers expect us to do. And even people expect us to do that. Okay, fine, you have done enough with the past. Can we use that information to talk about future? I mean, I would really like to work with some of the modelers in our institute or anyone who is interested. We can always share this data with anyone who is into modeling aspect, some of the quantitative data, and if they can make use of it to really talk about the future. Of course, since the periodicity that we see, uh, which is apparent in the record, by projecting that, we can think of what is going to happen in future, like say 120 year periodicity that we saw in the, the benthic parameteral record or the 200 year periodicity that we saw in isotopic records also. If we extend that from present, then definitely that can be the starting point to look at how the changes will be in future. But yes, the modelers can make good use of the data that we have generated. But, but Rajiv, uh, I remember my old work of the 77 year cycle, the Glisbol yes. solar cycle. Yes. And based on that, we predicted for the West Coast that coming decades will have a, a better rainfall. And that prediction was 1990. And uh, you can see that prediction came almost correct. The same approach okay. we can. Think of other river discharge uh, from the east coast of India, because you have such a wonderful and exhaustive data along all the rivers of the west coast of uh, east coast of India. Now, I think if you follow that approach, who knows that you may come up with a still better uh, predictions. And don't worry about going wrong. If you go wrong, you will you will develop the correct figure. Where was the mistakes? So don't be hesitant to. And don't pass on it to the modelers. Modelers will not do anything. I have seen it in the last 40 years. Sure, sure. I mean, data, of course, it's it's because of the student. Many of them have joined here. They work tirelessly to generate all that data. And we work with you in your group. So, of course, we, we will definitely try to look at the projection part of if we can make some use of this data to talk about future. Thank you. Great. Well, I think that um, that kind of uh, ties us up for today um, and the Monsoon Seminar Series uh, this week. Um, so please put your hands together again for this wonderful talk today um, by Dr. Rajiv Saraswat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And so before you all run away, um, just remember to tune in again in, I think, a couple of weeks uh, on April 27th for another talk, I believe, on Schedule B um, by Hema um, Achayuthan um, about, again, monsoon variability. So I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks, and I hope all of you have a very nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks. And.